G'day everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Australian Property Investment Podcast. I'm your host, Aaron Christie David, and for those that don't know me, I run a mortgage broking business called Atelier Wealth, where I help specialize in helping Australian families start out and scale up their investment property portfolios. Each and every episode, we like to bring in someone who's at the top of their game. I refer to them often as best in breed. You would have to be living under a rock if you're in the property space not to know who our next guest is today. He's a, I would say a serial offender. He's a repeat offender. We're going to call him <laughs> back on. Um, and I'm thrilled to welcome Paul Gossett from Pure Property Investment. Mate, welcome. Mate, you're too kind. Thanks for having me again, buddy. And good to see you. Well, I can keep going on and on. You're a good guy. You're a, you're a, you're a good surfer. Uh, dad, mate, there's, uh, there's so much free going on off the field, but we want to talk about what's happening on the field for yourself, mate. But before we do kick off, there's two things. One is, uh, be very clear that this episode is general in nature and not intended to give advice. So if you do need specialized advice, please seek out a professional that's going to help you. That's the first part. The second part is, mate, how the bloody hell are you? It's been ages. Uh, no, 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 it hasn't been, been a bit that way, mate. I, um, funny you just mentioned surfing. I had a bit of a mishap literally as of only yesterday. I went for a quick, uh, quick surf in my lunch break and, um, can't see it from this angle, but the back of my head has five stitches directly across the back of it. So I, uh, you mentioned I was a good surfer. Evidently, I'm not a great <laughs> surfer because I, I took off on a wave at my local point break and uh, tried to tuck in underneath the barrel and uh, the board slipped out, cracked me in the back of the head and uh, I came out looking like a shark attack victim. Had plenty of people coming to my aid, but uh, hand to head and straight over to emergency a few stitches later and had to unfortunately cancel a few appointments yesterday afternoon. But we'll persevere. Absolutely, mate. What uh, yeah. security makes you stronger, right? But, uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Blood floating around the water, especially in your neck of the woods. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, when this exactly. is serving was a contact sport, I'm like, this is why I keep my feet on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> but surfing is one of those things that looks harder than actually what it is. But, yeah, yeah, no, it can make uh, make a fool out of the um, the best of us, unfortunately. Perfect, mate. Now I want to catch up because I mean we've had a we've we've, we've crossed paths, you know, personally, professionally as well, and obviously through the industry, mate. But um, obviously, you kick goals, and and I think we're probably on a chance to catch up coming coming out of COVID and, and what the property market's going to look like. I guess mm. that's this next iteration. That's where I'm really, really keen to have a chat. To you going, you've got your your feet on the ground, you've got your ears on the ground as well about what's happening, and there's plenty of mixed sentiment. And you and I obviously deal with people that are buying, that are confident, that are looking for that next opportunity. But there is a there is a segment of the market that goes, oh look, I'm just unsure and a bit uncertain as well. So I don't want to call yep. the area it's not to play in that space, but there is a sense of reality. And the big reality is with rates going up, that's going to affect number one yields and, and cash flow. And then the ultimate headwind for an investor is capital growth because that can start mm. to grow on scale. So there's probably a lot in that. So let's kind of break it out a little bit into what you're currently seeing. Let's call it for the next short term. And what I mean by short term is probably between now and say the end of 2022. And then yep. let's kind of break that out of it. What you're going to see for the next couple of years as well as we move into a, a very different market from, from what mm. I think. Yeah, mate. Look, I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. And I think we're only just started what is going to be this new norm cycle in the, the next few months and the previous few months as to. You know, it only goes back to we were talking literally only a few months ago that this is for, for, for many property owners and investors, this is the first time we've actually seen an interest rate cycle increase. So a lot of this not only is stuff that's happening in the media, but the reality is it's uncharted territory for a lot of people to say what happens in this environment. And it's natural for people to fear it. I mean, it only goes back you know, a bit over two years ago when we said, hey, it's a pandemic. <laughs> um, and it's been it's it's official. It's a pandemic, and you've got the big four talking anywhere between a ten and a thirty three percent reduction in property value. Yeah. Um, and you know you, you, you're in uncharted waters for many of it, so you kind of unfortunately do get swept up in the hype for good and for bad. Um, and there's no doubt so many stories that we both have encountered with clients, with our own personal investments, and with a variety of other things, which you have to f- try and figure out. And I think at that time, and I guess if I, I go back and say, well, what do we expect short term? To your point. For the next six to 12 months, what do you expect medium term and long term? Well, the only time where you can really get some sort of understanding or a picture as to what to expect in these times is you've got to draw on experience. And if you don't have it yourself, you draw on data. And mm-hmm. data typically is good enough. Um, if you can look for, for good enough, rich enough data, you can usually find a segment of time where this has happened before, and not only once, but multiple times. Um, and for me, mate, I think one thing that is certain, I think, for the next six months is we're going to see a whole range of different aspects going through the media and, and it's all going to be 
doom and gloom, followed by potentially in two years' time, we're going to see a recession, followed by interest rate cuts, followed by a property boom, followed by a lack of supply, followed by massive population growth. There's literally all these things are circulating at the same time. So one thing I think people can bank on is expect to get scared witless as well as pumped up to, to you know the next level by depending on which you know, subscription of information you're going to receive. But you've really just got to say, guys, property has always and will always be a long-term play. And if you're focused on what's going to happen in the short term, whether it's going through the headies of the, the 20 and 30% annual growth we've seen over the last couple of years compounded, um, or it's the doom and gloom aspects, that is not why you should be buying property. If it is, in my opinion, it's the wrong asset class, full stop. Mm. Well said. And you mentioned about it being a long-term game. The last few years have really changed that game because you were able to quickly leverage and leverage and go again. Like that, that yep. mm, capital growth is unheard of. I mean, we're talking since late 80s, which is I think we would have been wee tackers at that point. But yeah, yeah, I feel like it, it brought a different investor to the market because they would have come in and get really quick gains. Mm. Which taken years for, for most traditional investors. Now they're going, hang on, this property game's not too bad. Yeah. One year and now it's almost like we've created a different breed of investor a little bit through like really strong and favorable conditions, right? Where we're not going to have that same level of growth moving forward. Yeah, no, completely, mate. And I think yeah, we've seen it before. You would have seen it before, most certainly in the, the Sydney booms and, and the Melbourne booms mm-hmm. and the Hobart booms. Um, you know, and in certain other cases, a couple of pockets, you know, probably back in the the early sort of 2010, 12 era where there was a lot of people who got caught up in the mining sector and they were buying in the far regional towns that had crazy booms at a very short period of time there and kind of thought that this game was an easy one. Um, The reality is property, if you're holding it for a decade, two decade period, you're going to have those really small windows of crazy growth. The reality of that though is that that happens for, you know, call it five to 10% of the whole time. The majority of it is typically that 60 to 80% is status quo, really boring. There'll be another five to 10% on the other side of the equation, which can be that time where people get swept up in the fear and think property is going to be the worst asset class I need to sell and get out of it full stop. But I guess going back to, to your point and what I was saying earlier as well, Matt, as, as to you know, what we've seen in the past in similar conditions, probably the last time we've probably been swept up in high inflation, increasing in interest rates, and essentially a few of those other components that sort of where we're experiencing right now is, is probably the decade between around about 1988 to 1998. Now, We've all, we're probably of the era, mate, where you and I would have heard our parents at some stage say, you know, that was a time, do you remember we were paying 18% interest, blah, blah, blah. Um, and we've heard it. We personally hadn't experienced it, but we have, we have heard it. Now, that's all good and well hearing it. But the, the key part, which we've done a really good deep dive into the last few months, is sort of saying, well, what happened in that decade? And not just what happened in one market, but what happened nationally and then drilling it down into a couple of major markets in between. So, some of the headline factors that happened in that decade. So let's say we go between 88 and 98. Inflation at, at its highest was sort of tracking around about 8% at average between 4 and 5% for that entire 10 years. Wow. Now, we're not at that point yet, but we are seeing that headline inflation really quite high. Yeah. Um, I don't expect we're going to see 4 or 5% inflation annually for, for the next decade, but that was one thing that happened. Yeah. We had interest rates, as we just said, you know, well, peaking at 17, 18%, but they averaged about 8% in that entire decade. So they were about double on average what we're essentially going to be experiencing in the next six months. So we had double the interest rate position as far as what we're paying for our money. Unemployment, which is an interesting one, which we sort of don't necessarily talk about in the media that much, but Mm -hmm. that averaged about 8%, was as high as 11% in that 10 years. We're half that. We're less than half that right now. And the headwinds are not there to say, hey, expect to see a crazy blowout in unemployment. And supply, well, to be fair, supply is about the same as where it is now. But un- when we're talking about uh, vacancy rates, we're sitting sub 1% vacancy rates across Australia for the most part, freestanding houses back then, talking 2%. So if I sort of say, well, let's draw some parallels. Yes, we had the same inflation. We had increasing in interest rates, much higher in- interest rates position then. Unemployment was double. Um, and we saw vacancy was actually double as well. So the question is, what happened to the property market in that decade? Well, here's some headline numbers. Australia grew by 71% as an aggregate in that entire 10 years. Right. Now, that's quite interesting because the fact that if you if you took out the growth of Australian property and said all these things are going to happen in the next 10 years and you said, what do you expect to happen in the Australian property market? I think a lot of people would think, well, it's going to tank. Now, I'm not suggesting I'm going to see 71% growth in Australia. However, 
here's probably a key part which I think everyone needs to remember, and this is normal, is the fact that yes, 71% growth across you know all of the three or four hundred thousand thousand properties that transact every year. However, if you bought in Adelaide in 1988, that property would have grown by 28% by 1998. If you bought in Brisbane in 1988, that property would have grown on average by 105% by 1998. And the reason why I guess I highlight they're the two extremes is that in between that was a range of different markets. But it goes back to what we're going to experience is a normal property market. You're going to have some markets which will outperform, some markets which will underperform, and a whole whole host of markets which will do what they've done previously, which is provide consistent capital growth and consistent cash flow. But you notice I'm not talking about 12 months or six months. I'm talking about 10 years. And for me, that is the key part here is buy what you can afford, focus on 10 years, focus on the fundamentals of why you're buying it now, and is it in a good position to see it go through a robust growth position over the next decade. Beautiful. Mate, well said. Well said. One thing you mentioned there is cash flow. And you mm. know, our world in finance is then the, the, the repayments and the cash flow on the property. I know you've seen your spreadsheets when you're working with your clients. Mm. The breakdown on cash flows, best case, worst case scenario, for example, as well. Now factoring in you know, rising rates. And you, yeah, you could you could subscribe to one um, school of thought, which is rates will then you know, bump up, increase the next year, year and a bit. And then start to kind of drop or, or or hold flat for a little bit. That's one thought. Look, we just don't know. I mean, the RBA initially came out said that rates weren't going to go up till 2024, and here we are mid 2022, yeah. staring down the barrel of rate rises between now and the end of the year. So I feel like we can't weigh into that because that's just unknown, and we'd be speaking. Yeah. However, what we do know is rates are going to go up. Therefore, it's going to impact cash flow. Therefore, it's going to impact repayments. So the question here is, what happens if you've got? And so quite a lot of our investors, you know multiple properties, generally interest only, so you know, lower repayments. However, you know, if that rate doubles between now and the end of the year, what happens with rents and what happens with cash? So what happens in your mm. you know, being being at the coal face with your investors, how do they weather this storm, which is then mm. meant to last for at least another year or so? Yeah, good question, mate. And I think the, the reality is is that there is going to be certain people who have bought property thinking that to your point, mate, is that they, they say, let's take the RBA's word as gospel and then all of a sudden say, we'll be, we'll be kosher until at least 2024 and then that's next year's problem. The reality is, you know, as you've said, mate, you, you can't rely on anyone else other than yourselves. And there's a couple of things. A, you know, you, you'd know this better than anyone is the fact that most people are going to be stress testing their numbers with an extra 2 or 3% added onto that because that's how they get serviced on the loan itself. So they should be able to afford at least a 2% increase in interest rates. Now, is that going to mean that their property is cash flow positive? Well, potentially, no, not at all. Um, the other component, which I think is also quite important for people to understand, not only if they're thinking about buying now, but if they've bought in the last six or 12 months is, depending on where they've bought, the reality is, and I mentioned vacancy rates not so long back, is that we're currently tracking close to 20-year lows in vacancy rates, particularly in freestanding houses in Australia. Yeah. What that is doing and what that will continue to do is that's going to put upward pressure on rents. So in many markets, if I mention markets such as Brisbane, markets such as Perth, markets such as Adelaide, even Sydney and Melbourne, you're seeing freestanding houses, the value of rents increasing between 10 and in some cases 20% on an annual basis. And mm. if we go back to look at rental growth uh, as, a, as a delta figure over the last 10 years, rental growth as a dollar has actually been quite quite insipid because it's basically been on the back end of interest rates going down, so the pressure of, of rents hasn't gone up. We're actually now just entering into that rental growth cycle. So although it won't give people solace to say, hey, you bought a property now and it's on a variable interest only rate and that rate's going to go up 1% in the next 12 months minimum, um, yes, they're going to have to potentially absorb a bit of cash flow shortfall in that time. It's not going to be exponential, but it will be some. But I think people, investors especially, need to be aware to say, Put it in the calendar, understand where your tenants are at, make sure you're right on top of where market rent is and not like previous years or five-year cycles that have gone by where you've got 2 or 3% vacancy rates and you kind of have to be cautious to not lose your tenant. There is a shortage of rental property in Australia and that's not going to change. So you must be on the front foot to make sure that your rents are increasing in line with the market rents. And I've seen so many times over the last six or 12 months in particular where I've got clients even who we've bought three, four, five years ago who haven't stayed on top of it. And they might be 40, 50% below the market rent on their property. And you're talking, that is the difference of a property going well below cash flow neutral even 
to essentially keeping up with the level of increase in interest rates. Yeah, spot on. And that's, I mean, it's all part of the annual review process, really. It's mm. I mean, we, we uh, subscribe to that, that idea, which is keep the team around you. Everyone has their, their role responsibility. And as your investment property, you need to hold your team to account. The investment annual review, how much equity growth is there? Get evaluations done. Is it time for rent reviews? Is it time to look at the strategy for the next 12 months as well? So just like you'd meet with your accountant, you got to then lock it in with your team as well to make sure that everyone's serving you and helping you grow as well, right? That's completely, mate, completely. And, and I think look, you in your position, your team at Atelier, mate, I think if I was looking at an era for a broker, I mean, we just saw the data ticked over that 70% of all people now use brokers in Australia, which is great to see that that is still growing and it's growing exponentially. But I personally think there hasn't been a more important time for a broker in the last decade because... You know, essentially, if you kept your rates variable, you would have done fine with your rates over the last decade because there hasn't really been any upward pressure. But this is a time where your broker's your broker's valuation of making sure that not only are they extracting equity that will no doubt be there for people's portfolios if they've held an asset for more than 12 months, get that money out. And secondly, making sure that you've got to be comfortable shopping your rates around because this is the time where you are going to find huge differences. And banks, some banks are going to be extremely hungry for your business. And I think you and your team, mate, you, you'll be on the front foot to be able to provide people with that response. Ah, oh, Thanks, mate. Yeah, appreciate that. And yeah, exactly that, that message is what we're hearing as an industry going. And sometimes, not sometimes, I'll say that most times is when you experience headwinds, whether that's any industry, that's when you're mm. sorted out. Yeah, so during the good times, anyone could go into a bank or to a broker, any broker, and get, get the loan done. It was easier the last few years. As we come into an evolving and changing market, banks will then start to change policy. We're going to see servicing changes. We're going to see all these different shadings, for example. Uh, I feel like this is the time when I speak about your team is the time to seek out the right team because in a rising market, there were, just like your industry, there were plenty of buyers agents that started and were able to kind of mm-hmm. ride the wave. Mm. That is when the times get a little bit tougher, that we'll see the the tide go out a little bit, and this is when the you know, the cream rises to the top, mate. So, yeah, I feel mm. like we're we're very fortunate. Our businesses are very fortunate. We've matured a little bit. We've got great clients, and now we want to use that knowledge to help inspire that next breed of client as well and investor. Yeah. Mm. No, completely, mate. No. I mean, yeah, we're probably a little bit grayer and saltier and crustier than what we were when we were sort of bright-eyed, <laughs> bushy-tailed, you know, 10 years ago when we were both talking about doing all this stuff that we're doing right now. But, I mean, you, you, your point with the fact that, you know, you go through these boom cycles and it doesn't matter if it's property growth or it doesn't matter if it's 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 finding the best rates or, or structuring mm-hmm. loans correctly or an accountant's doing the same thing, financial planners, whatever that facility of that A-team needs to be for yourself. Mm-hmm. I think the reality is, is, is on both sides of that, that equation, you just can't get caught up with a hype because I can guarantee you, you in particular, mate, you go through the, the Royal Commission into the banking sector only three or four years ago. You know, a lot of brokers, a lot of financial planners, they basically said, look, too hard basket, too uncertain, we're out. Um, and, and I think, you know, in Sydney, for Sydney investors in particular, and probably Melbourne to a lesser extent, if we go back and take heed for what happened in that time, you know, we had a lot of uncertainty in the property market because ultimately we saw these serviceability caps increase. And if we've got pretty short memories. In Sydney, the property market went backwards by about 15% in a two-year period. Melbourne went backward by about 10% in a two-year period, just in between 2017 and essentially mid-2018. You know, that was only four years ago. So, you know, you've got to, you've got to remember, if, that, if you chose to take the advice of what you thought the media was saying is, hey, the market's tanking, get your money out quick, then you know what you wouldn't have had? You wouldn't have had the, the next 40% growth that happened in the past three and a half, four years in those same markets. And as sure as the day is long, you know, we're going to talk about this in 10 years' time, you and I, and say, remember that time where we went through COVID and this crazy inflation and rising interest rates? Imagine you sold everything in 2022, 2023, and just said, look, I'm just going to sit on the sidelines and I think there's going to be better buying in five and 10, 15 years. This has happened before. It will happen again. So people just need to be comfortable saying this is part of the cycle and there will also be fantastic buying opportunities as there always is in these times. Yeah, spot on. Spot on that. Well said. You, I just want to backtrack a little bit because you're speaking about where you're seeing opportunities and, um, and mm. you where you're buying. So, again, I don't want to give away your secret sauce, but you mentioned kind of three key areas of so Brisbane, Perth, and Adelaide. And we've kind of mm. we tend to meet a few brokers recently from interstate and they're saying the same thing. So, the Sydney brokers are saying how we've had this huge intensity, this huge growth, and now we're kind of seeing that just slowly start to dissipate a little bit. Mm. Whereas 
they're a little bit behind the wave that we just had and they're going, mate, we're still seeing, you know, great clearance rates, still seeing a huge amount of people attending the auctions and that level of competitiveness on the ground. So take me through mm. you know, corridors that you're seeking out for clients. What are you seeing on the ground and why those particular areas that you're seeking out, mate? Yeah, bang on, mate. I think, look, the, the, I guess to, to make the, the first point is that we buy right across Australia. We mm. essentially bought in every major city other than Darwin. Over the last 10 years, we've bought a couple of thousand properties right across those areas. Um, and it's at different times for different reasons. I think to your point, our focus, and which has been and probably will continue to be for, I think, at least the next 12, 18, 24 months, will certainly be in pockets of of the southeast Queensland markets, particularly around certain areas, freestanding established houses in Brisbane, still performing really well. Although they are and they have been on the back of 40, 50% growth in some cases in the last two years alone, rents are still growing, supply is still low, and they are still comparatively when you factor in household incomes, they are still actually comparatively quite affordable when you compare them to the, the East Coast, you know, brothers of, of and sisters of, of Sydney and Melbourne. Um, that's a market which we're still seeing sub 1% vacancy rates. We're still seeing headline growth of, of 0.5 to 1% per, per month yes. at this stage. And if you look at what's in store for the, the, the growth of the infrastructure, jobs creation, it's looking like one of the best economies in the country. It doesn't look like that's going to change for a, a very long period of time. They've got a lot of money committed and they've got a very robust economy with very minimal unemployment and very minimal supply. So will that change? Like, will it continue on 20 to 30% growth? Absolutely not. It can't. No market will continue that, but it will continue to see good, consistent, strong growth performance. And if you can select the correct asset, you're still talking four, four and a half percent gross rental yields, which will still mean that your property is within that cash flow neutral band, give or take. Um, so for me, that's that's comfortable. But again, I think a few keys there. Established freestanding houses will probably will they will be or have been the outperformer. I think they'll continue to be the outperformer as far as asset types in that market. Now, there's, there's obviously a range depending on your budget, but that will range on those different fluctuations on the entry level, mid tier, and, and more the blue chip markets. If I go to Adelaide as an example, I, I think that market's had a cracking two years. It's it's had extreme growth. Rental growth's been really good. Uh, the biggest challenge I think for Adelaide has been what the challenge has been for 40 years for Adelaide. It will have these breakout times. Now, it hasn't been out of whack with all the other markets and it typically moves in that same unison. The challenge for Adelaide longer term is it hasn't really broken out of that mould of what attracts people to Adelaide. Are they seeing something that's going to consistently see that demand of population growth and infrastructure growth? It still hovers around that million touch over a million population and to be fair it's been population neutral for a very long time it's seen a little bit of a growth period over covid um but i don't necessarily have the same confidence in the next 5 10 15 years for the broader market I'm not saying it's in a bad bad position now but yes it's going to continue to see growth rents going to be continuing to grow i just don't have the same confidence based on what allures people to that market in general yeah you saying like a and we're not here to solve Adelaide's tourism or, or, or draw card problem, but it may need to reinvent itself. I mean, you look at yeah. Hobart and I feel like Hobart reinvented itself. It put itself mm. as a party, foodie, touristy capital of Australia and kind of took that mantelpiece and people now see it as a destination, whereas Adelaide probably doesn't have that same draw card. Yeah, it's got the mm. yeah, it's got some government projects. Yeah, it's got some, some livability to it. But it doesn't have that same level of attraction that maybe your Sydney and Hobart still or Gold Coast even or something. Yeah, no, completely, mate. And I think yeah, the, the interesting thing with um, Hobart and Tassie in general um, is it's probably taken a lot of market share away from New Zealand, funnily enough, as well, especially during yeah. COVID and the travel bubbles. But yeah. the reality of what they've always had, which you know people you know complain about nimbyism or not in my backyard scenarios, but. <laughs> They also had this this complete position for such a long period of time. Like anyone's familiar with Sydney, it's kind of like the equivalent of the Leichhardt Council where we would like trying to put a DA in to actually renovate or change the facade or something. That has been the position of Hobart, Launceston, Devonport, Burnie for a very long period of time. And what that eventually did is it built a rod for their own back where supply five years ago, I know you and I, Matt, we, we, I personally bought, I think we bought close to 300 properties in a two-year period of time there. And at that time, you saw the the... You know, we saw vacancy rates still where they are now, basically non-existent. But the actual level of new property coming to the market, I think at one period of time, was less than 10,000 properties across across the entire uh, Tasmanian market was slated to come to the actual new market within a three-year period. Now, they don't have the same crazy, obviously, population growth that the bigger markets will get. But that was something that, and still is, 
a good thing for property there because it essentially restricts supply. There's no issues with land, but can that land be developed? And the answer across the board is no. But now they're, they're going back to the issues about how do we create more supply? Well, you know what? You can't just change those laws. You can't just change the sentiment like that. Property is slow moving for good and bad reasons. And that's a classic example of what happens when people as a collective restrict supply as you get these markets that boil and boil and boil. And that's done a really good job. But I guess the last one that you you mentioned is Perth. And that's been a, a very, uh, you know, it's obviously, it's been a market that if, if anyone goes back to the data between about 2005 and 2000 and about 2012, that market almost tripled in about a 10 year period. Now that's, that's insane. That's a very strong position. Um, and that was obviously on the back of a very strong resources boom. Uh, and also a very distinct lack of supply and a high amount of population growth and huge amounts of job demand, et cetera. Yeah. Between 2013 and 2019, that market went backwards about 30%. And That's to be honest, like, and, they, and that is going, it was impossible to even refinance a client, let alone you know, the sentiment yeah. in the market as well. So uh, absolutely. Ed wins and they had it. Yeah, they had it left, right, and center, and you had negative equity. You had people's sentiment was through the floor, and none of, none of it was good news, unless they bought in the mid two thousands and they still had a strong position. Now we're starting to see that that is transitioning. Now, the last two or three years, and we've been actively buying that market in the last probably year or two ourselves as well. Is you're starting to see the balance where you've now got that market as essentially close to the equivalent of the highest average household incomes in Australia, almost on par with Sydney, a little bit below Canberra. Um, but you've got the lowest mortgage commitment rates of any major city in Australia. So you've got the cheapest, most affordable housing. You've got vacancy rates sub 0.5%. So essentially no supply. You've got minimal approval. So future supply coming to that market also looks very minimal. So you can't have this huge amount of glut of property coming to that market. And you've also got an economy that went through its boom phase, went through its bust phase, and is now going back through what I'd probably personally deem as more of an equilibrium phase as opposed to a boom phase again. They're not going to make the same mistakes of just saying, hey, resources are back, so we're back. They really put and plowed a lot more money into diversifying the future planning to your point of, of Hobart and the surrounds in Tassie. Their plan is to access Asia. Their plan is to say, look, we want to be um, not only the, the health and tourism, um, but also the education hub of the West Coast because they have that distinct advantage. And they're now thinking, well, how can we compete with East Coast? Well, you know what? You are on the same time frame. You're on the, essentially a, a three, four, five hour flight from Asia compared to eight, nine, 10 hours and, and four hours behind at certain times of the year to the East Coast of Australia. Use that to your advantage. It's a beautiful climate, beautiful area. They've got all the same hallmarks as the East Coast has. They probably have just been too, too, too well positioned to say, look, we don't need to think outside the box because we've got this, these big holes that we keep digging and people keep demanding what's in those holes. So let's just keep going down that pathway. But I think they've learned their lesson from the last decade. And I think this year will be, sorry, this decade rather for Perth won't see the same crazy growth. Won't see, definitely won't see the cr same crazy demise and we'll see much more of a, a transitional market which will mature, similar to what Brisbane, I think, has done over the last decade as well. Yeah, nice. Wonderful. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's what we love getting is a bit of that sentiment. You know, obviously, people pay you and your team for that level of advice, but I really appreciate you sharing what you're doing because you're not holding any secrets back. It's like no, people know where buyers' agents are buying, but then it's that, that ability to pull the trigger or make that decision. That's mm -hmm. where they're going to seek out expertise, whether that's yourself and your team or any other buyers' agent going, find the right properties, right for your your brief and um, what are you looking to invest? Is it the capital growth? Is it the cash flow? Is it the, the development upside, for example? And your brief then becomes customised and bespoke for yourself and your team to then execute, right? So. Agreed. Agreed, mate. Yeah, for sure. And, um, you know, that's 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 status quo. I mean, nothing's going to change there. And, you know, I'm sure that when you and I catch up probably in 12 months' time and try to chew the fat about what's happening in the market, I'm sure there'll be some differences and I'm sure we'll talk yeah. about, hey, you know, that market, yeah, it's done well, but we're probably not there anymore because it's showing that it's past its prime. And there's here's a new market that's probably mm -hmm. entering into more of a value proposition. And, you know, we've gone through this over and over and we'll continue to do so. Uh, well said. Well said. Mm -hmm. um, or an unscripted question, but I want to pin you up because yeah. yeah. I like to see skin in the game and where and what you're doing. So I know, you've, you know you, you're, you're ambitious. You're, you're always you know, pushing the envelope in terms of what you're doing yep. at the level. So without having kind of, you know, bear your soul a little bit, what's no, next? What's the power solid name? Mate, there's always plenty going on. Um, probably always a little bit past plenty or too much. And uh, I know we're always, I'm always guilty of just pushing it that little bit too far and thinking, <laughs> shit, we've got a bit too much on at the moment. Um, but from our side of things, mate, we've got plenty. Um, so I've got personally, I bought a house last year that we're doing a reno to, sold my current house, but that's going to be a, a delayed settlement. So we're moving into that. 
beyond that, mate, I, I personally, about a year and a half, two years ago, you know, right in the thick of the pandemic, I, I got my finances up and ready and, and, and went shopping, went shopping pretty hard. So well, I went shopping for development sites. I went shopping for development sites at a time where the market was quite depressed. So I've got a, a 14 factory site in, in Caring Bar in Sydney that we're, we're going to be kicking off later this year with a, a, it's more of a build to hold. So it's factories, build to hold, tenants out. Um, we've got a premium uh, duplex site again in, in, in Sydney that um, we bought a best part of a year and a half, two years ago, off market, really depressed sale at the time. That'll be a buy, build and hold. Um, and I've also got a, a much bigger site up in northern New South Wales, kind of on the border of New South Wales and, and Queensland, which we're, uh, we're halfway through Sybils on a 2022 20, house development up there as well. So that one's again, probably buy, we're, we're going through DA, build, and we'll probably sell half of that, keep half. Um, and the intention is that, you know, if I look at opportunities, if I talk to my, about my buyer's agent team, who are all property investors themselves, I know actively there's probably been a, a development site, one of them have bought, um, which has got a buy, build, retain, and and also they've got two other sites next to it they're going to be building in northern Brisbane, two other sites in Perth that they've bought. One's just a straight up buy and hold hot house, high cash flow. The other one's going to be a one into three lot subdivision. Um, and then we also had a client, uh, sorry, a, a, a uh, team member of ours bought a an off market uh, special in, in Newcastle only about well, probably eight months ago. Again, delayed settlement that'll settle very shortly. So we're, we're fingers in a lot of pies um, as always, and and definitely fully uh, aware of what's going on in all these markets because we don't just talk it; we we certainly walk it. Yeah, correct. And that's what I love. That's why I asked the question. So I, I mm. almost hand on heart say I knew that you would have fingers in a few pies because I've seen you. You walk the talk. You you put your money where your mouth is. You invest. You're walking hand hand in hand with your investors. So it's great, and I feel like that gives us it gives investors a lot of confidence. Going well, Paul's doing it. You almost have got to a point you've got a little bit more to lose than sometimes to gain, right? And that's yeah, that, absolutely. That real tipping point. We go, hey, look, I can actually sit back, and someone in your situation could sit back and just go, look, I can ride this out for a little bit, but it's going. Hey, mm. I want to keep moving forward, and sometimes taking risk is the only way to move forward. Yeah, exactly, mate. I mean, it's very easy to do nothing, um, but uh, it's not not way that you and I are wired, and I think it's not way that we know how to get ahead. Is that it's it's just it's just the, the avenue un, un, untrodden, which is the one that we always try to look at, and we know that you know. But I'm, I, I genuinely, I mean, the whole cliche is that we don't want to be sitting here in, in 15, 20 years and regret not doing something. I, I'm certainly happier to regret doing something than saying I regret not knowing what would happen if I went down that pathway. Yeah, well, hence why I've got the the five stitches in the back of my head right now. Mate. <laughs> okay, a little scar reminder going. Yeah, exactly, buddy. Exactly. Yeah. Honestly, hey, Paul, I know you've been super generous with your time and your insights and, and giving away a lot of your knowledge, mate. So I want to say thank you very much for your generosity and thanks for being a friend of the show. I know you've you've been on before and we'll continue to get back on because uh, not only were you well sought out, but your heart's in the right place, mate. And I see that from our clients that have gone through you and the clients you've, you know we've worked together on. Um, they are the type of client which is don't sit still, don't accept the status quo, and they're the investors that I feel will keep driving this market forward and um, and raising more quality as opposed to more quantity. So well done. Completely. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on again, buddy. Uh, pleasure. If you found that helpful, uh, what we'll do is include Paul Glossop and the Pure Property Investment team's details. If you do want to reach out, have a chat to them, by all means, go for it. Uh, I'll be very, very clear and open. Anyone that we bring onto the show, anyone that we work with, we do not have any referral or commercial agreements with. It's all recommended or uh, introduced based on trust or um, or connection there as well. So they're the right fit. So, Paul, thank you very much. Uh, we'll catch you on another episode of the Australian Property Investment Podcast very shortly. If you found that helpful, send us some comments, ask us a question or give us a thumbs up and subscribe for more as well. Until then, take care.